Hello. In this chapter, we're going to study bones and bone structure. Now, subsequent chapters, we're going to get really into the detail of the ax axial skeleton and the appendicular skeleton. This is going to give you some basics about bone structure and uh, bones and the bone tissue. So we're going to get started with looking at all of this. When we look at the skeletal system, it consists of the axial skeleton, which is along the longitudinal axis of the body. This will include the bones of the skull, hyloid, vertebral column, ribs, and sternum. We also have, of course, the auditory ossicles. Um, the appendicular skeleton, these are the bones of the upper and lower limbs. Now, this is going to include the support of girdles. So this is going to include the bones of the limbs and bones of the pectoral, that's the upper uh, limbs, and the pelvic girdles, which is the part of the lower limbs. These attach the limbs to the axial skeleton. When you look at the difference between the axial skeleton and the appendicular skeleton, the axial skeleton is roughly about 80 bones. Actually, it is 80 bones. And the appendicular is 126 bones. And when we look at these definitions and these differences, really what you see are everything along the midline, which is uh, pretty much the vertebrae, the ribs, the uh, skull, and the functions of, of the axial skeleton protects the spinal cord, the heart, the lungs, the brain, okay? And you can see the differences there with the appendicular, which are pretty much revolving around limbs that are going to be connected to the axial skeleton. Now, the appendicular skeleton, as I said, relates to the limbs. It allows us to move and manipulate objects and includes all the bones beside the axial skeleton. So, of course, we've got the limbs and the support of girdles. The functions of the skeletal system include support, storage of minerals and lipids, the production of red blood cells, and actually all sorts of blood cells because it would also include white blood cells and uh, the platelets. Uh, for protection of organs, as I mentioned, and for leverage. We're going to get into that later on when we talk about joints. Now, when we classify bones according to the shape, we come into a couple of different ones. One is the sutural bones. These develop between joints, particularly the sutures of, of the uh, skull. And so their numbers vary between individuals, so they're really not counted. The flat bones are thin. They're plate-like structures. Now, don't think of plate as flat. That's one point to keep in mind. These include the cranial uh, bones, the sternum, the ribs, and the scapula. Long bones are better known because they are longer than they are wider. So they consist of a diathesis, which is the shaft, the epiphysis, which is the expanded knob-like ends. Examples of bones here would include the humerus, the radius, and the ulna in the forearm, the femur, and the tibia and the fibula in the lower leg. When we get into the other sets of bones, ooh, irregular bones, they vary in shape. So these would include things like the facial bones, the vertebrae, and the pelvic bones. Sesamoid bones are embedded in tendons at articulations. Articulations is another term for joints. The best example of this is the patella. Short bones, where the length and the width are about equal, include the bones of the wrist, the carpals, and the ankle, the tarsals. And here you see a basic review here. As you can see here, the, the sutural bone, there's variations. You can get a couple of different skulls and see variations because where the sutures come together, there may be a small island that is in the midst of all of this uh, bones coming together. And this island of bone will be isolated, but they differ from person to person. 
When we talk about irregular bones, we can see these extensions, the knobby extensions at, and the wide area here of the, uh, the body of the vertebrae. Um, if you take a look here at the short bones, these are like the carpal bones, the tarsal bones, etc. Here's an example of the sesamoid bone. The sesamoid bone would be attached to uh, two tendons, one in the upper direction, one in the lower direction, so it adjusts as the knee is moved. Long bones, as you can see, this would be the shaft, the diaphysis, and at the end you would have the epiphyses here and here. And then, of course, flat bones, which include like the parietal bone, the frontal bone, the sternum, etc. Now, bone markings, as I've said before in lab, and I'll say it again, um, you really need to know the terms and where they're located on the various bones. So all bones have distinctive markings or landmarks designated for specific functions. Many are attachment sites to ligaments, bones, muscles, tendons. Some help form a joint or help provide stability for a joint. Others are passageways for blood vessels, ducts, or nerves. If you look at page 89, I encourage you to review and memorize all terms on the chart. Here's a table that you would see. So all the anatomical terms and understand the definition behind them. So we're talking about elevations, projections, that would be the process and ramus. Processes formed where tendons and ligaments attach, that could be trochanter, tuberosity, tubercle, crest, line, spine. Processes formed for articulation with adjacent bones include head, neck, condyle, trochlear, and faucet. Depressions, and what I mean by depressions are sort of uh, uh, cavities or crater structures. These would be fossa and sulcus. Openings would be foramen, canal, metis, fissure, sinus. And if you look here, you've got some very good examples here from the femur, which includes, of course, the condyle, tubercle, faucet, head, neck, and trochanter. And then you have the skull, where you have, of course, the ramus, the fissure, the forama, uh, the process, the sinus. And here you have the humerus, which would include the trochlear, the fossa, the tuberosity, the neck, sulcus, head, and tubercle. And then finally the pelvis, where you can see the crest, the fossa down here, spine, line, foramen, and ramus. Now another good um, table, and I got this from another text. I like this one also because it breaks it down and gives you more examples of bones so that you know what these are. You'll find this in table 6.1. Now, this is not in your text. This is an additional um, tool to help you to review. As you can see, the projections that help form joints, the depressions and openings. You can see some of the bone markings of the humerus, as I mentioned before. Is it? So you really need to know these before you uh, continue. I strongly urge you to do this because we will have to uh, both in lab and in other situations, identify bone markings uh, on specific bones. Now, the long bone transmits forces along the shaft and will have a rich blood supply. One of the key differences, as I mentioned before, is that bone tissue will have a uh, vascular blood supply, whereas cartilage does not. We have to get used to certain structural terms here. The epiphysis, which is the expanded area at the end of each bone. Uh, the epiphysis consists largely of turbicular, that is, spongy bone. The metaphysis is a narrow zone that connects the epiphysis to the shaft of the bone. The diaphysis is a long shaft, and it's tubular in shape and consists of compact bone walls. Those compact bone walls are essential to support uh, whatever the upper or lower limbs are. Structural terms, well, let's continue. Medullary cavity, that is the uh, marrow cavity, sort of on the inside. It's filled with red marrow, which is actively producing blood cells, and yellow marrow, which looks more like chicken fat. That's inactive bone marrow, but yellow can be, with uh, certain hormonal signals, uh, converted into red, especially when there is a lower amount of oxygen present or 
a lower uh, hemocrit present. Articular cartilage covers the ends of the epiphyses. It is avascular and relies on diffusion via the synovial fluid for nutrients. N uh, the nutrient foramen, this is a bone marking. It's an opening for nutrient carrying arteries and veins. And then we have structural terms, the perosteum. This covers the bone surfaces except at the joints. It contains a network of blood vessels, lymphatic and, uh, vessels, and sensory nerves. So if you take a look here, you can see where the spongy bone exists. This is very common. They'll take either, um, they'll take a femur, split it, or saw through it. And what you can see here is the epiphyses here the metaphyses right about here, and then the diaphyses here. In this area, the diaphyses is very uh, much filled with compact bone. The medullary cavity is a space in here. This is where the bone marrow will be. Then, of course, you have the metaphyses down here and the epiphyses here. One of the things to keep in mind is that as the body weight is applied, and you now have an applied force, it kind of goes through the bone, with compression on the medial side of the shaft, but tension on the lateral side of the shaft is uh, somewhat relieved. This is what is going to shape the, the uh, direction and the formation of bone. All right. You notice down in the lower part here, there's a lot of spongy bone. Now, this spongy bone does not mean that they're just empty air pockets they are filled with uh, bone marrow as well. All right. Now, here's a, an example of the vascularization that exists in a long bone. You can see the epiphyseal artery and vein through here. You have a covering of articular cartilage. You have a sensory nerve coming in through there. The, me the metaphyseal artery, of course, is red and the vein is blue. You have the metaphysis right here. Notice the medullary cavity here where you have blood vessels coming in. Usually when you have them coming from the outside, this would be what we call, and you have a little hole in the bone, this is what we call the nutrient forama. Now, the outer covering will be perosteum, compact bone, then the medullary cavity. And the medullary cavity is usually lined with some spongy bone but it's not going to be as profound as you see up here, okay? And then, of course, you've got another mes uh, metaphyseal artery and vein down at the bottom here, and you have what is called the epiphyseal line. Now, to help you understand this, the epiphyseal line will fully calcify, and that's when growth stops of the bone in the sense of the lengthwise growth. Usually, this happens somewhere between Roughly 16 through 21 is a rough average, usually 18. Usually this is how you can also tell whether the individual is still an adolescent or an adult. Now, here's the perosteum. You notice that it's kind of a layer here, and it has connections. You have connections here from the blood vessels with the superficial osteons, the sensory nerves, and you have branches of the nutrient artery and vein. The parosteal arteries and veins will be up through here. Now, what you have to keep in mind is that bone is a calcified matrix that's managed and maintained by various cell types. We have to have a large amount of blood vessels present because we have a metabolically active structure called bone. And if that seems to be a very strange statement, Think about this. As you live and you have even injuries or something else like that, you have the capability to repair bone. Usually when, when this stops, you are at uh, either uh, dead or you're very elderly, which can happen. That some areas will become uh, much more or less just dead bone tissue. But let's start at the beginning. We have osteogenic cells. These are called osteoprogenitor. We also call them stem cells. 
They maintain the population of osteoblasts for fracture repair and are located in the cellular layer of the endosteum. Osteoblasts is where you have ossification, osteogenesis. I always try to help my students by giving this concept. Osteoblasts, B blasts build. Osteoclasts are those that are basically uh, breaking down stuff. Now, osteoblasts will lay down osteoid, which is a pre-bone matrix. Then uh, they'll boost calcium deposits for calcium salt deposition. And this will eventually lead to the conversion of osteoid to bone tissue. Osteocytes uh, are basically mature bone cells. They maintain the bone structure. They're located in the lacunae. And they are be in between bone layers are called the lamella. And this is all part of the ostea, osteons. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more in a second. Osteocytes also extend cellular processes for contact with other osteocytes via these very fine lines, these almost like little fractures called the caniculi. Now, osteoclasts are derived from immune cells, monocytes, and macrophages. They play a key role in bone repair. They're involved with osteolysis and, in essence, bone resorption. Now, by the way, don't put, put this away and just say, well, what they do is they just kind of gobble up all the bone the calcium mineral. No, they will free up the calcium ions and they will also release enzymes to break down the collagen, um, which is kind of like these protein fibers that provide for strength and resiliency in the bone structure itself. But I'll get more into this in a minute. When we look at the structures in the central canal, this is where you're going to see arteries, veins, nerve fibers, etc. And then you have these lamella. These are these uh, structures that make up the osteo. Now, what you look here and see are collagen fibers, but they run in different directions. This one's going in this direction. This one's going in this direction. This is very important because it provides for the strength and resiliency of bone tissue to handle twisting forces as well as compressive forces and uh, forces that might cause a blow or something like that because it's diffused across the uh, different lamellae. Now, I brought this up because <laughs> it was interesting. This was a uh, pumping station. It's a water pumping station nearby where I reside. And what they did, you have to understand, is that a massive water pump was going to be put in here. That's about 11,000 pounds, and you've got a lot of heavy equipment that's put into this pumping station. So what does that mean? Well, if you just use just plain concrete, the weight itself could eventually cause cracks and the crumbling of the concrete. Instead, what you see are these lines. They're not really lines. They're actually pieces of steel called rebar. And what rebar's job is to provide reinforcement for the concrete and to keep the concrete from buckling. This is where we get the term uh, reinforced concrete. And what the rebar does is it provides the capability of handling intense forces and pressures um, because of weight. That's not unlike what you see in bone. You see, when you, when you look at long bone, you look at bone, you've got these osteon structures, but inside is not just merely calcium phosphate and calcium carbonate. If you remove all of that, what you've got is a proteinaceous mix. And when you look at this here, they took these chicken bones, dipped them into vinegar, let them stay for a while, and the vinegar would break down the uh, calcium, remove the calcium mineral, but what you still have is this proteinaceous, gauzy structure that still helps reinforce and hold together the bone. If you look at bone, you see these osteoids, and the center would be the central canal. They also call that uh, the haversion canal. And in these haversion canals, you have the blood vessels, the nerves, etc., and around them are lamellae. And in those little divots there that you see here, 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 
that's where you're going to find osteocytes. Now, if you look at this up closer, this is the lacunae, and inside is a osteocyte. But if you see these tiny fissures here, these are cytoplasmic extensions to connect one osteocyte to another. Now, on the inner part where you have just a spongy bone, you will have osteoclasts, and they're one of the few cells that have multiple nuclei. Osteoclasts will be involved in breaking down some of these uh, lamellae, not only the proteinaceous part, but the calcium uh, salts part. An osteoblast would be involved in the construction, the building, and usually it's on the outside walls, okay? Now, when we talk about compact bone consists of parallel osteons, we have the central canal, the haversian canal. And this is important because you really do have to have blood vessels and nerves passing through, keeping all the cells alive, providing nutrients where necessary. But the central canal runs parallel to the, to the surface of the bone. So basically it's going lengthwise. So you have to have a connection from osteon to osteon from the outside of the bones going inward. That's where you have what's called a perforating canal, otherwise known as Volkmann's canal. These extend perpendicular to the surface, supply blood to the osteons deeper in the bone and into tissues of the medullary cavity. When I talk about lamellae, they're concentric, circumferential, and interstitial. The concentric are nested layers around the central canal. Circumferential you'll find on the far edges, located on the inner and outer surfaces of the bone, connected by perosteum. And on the inner surface, we didn't get to mention it yet much, but it's the endosteum. That kind of lines the inner surfaces of the bone, particularly around the spongy bone. Okay, and you'll find it a lot as a lining on the inner surface of the medullary ca uh, cavity. The circumferential is produced during growth and maintenance of the bone. The interstitial, though, is really filling in spaces between osteon, osteons in compact bone. It remain, it's basically the remains of osteons broken down by the osteoclasts. Here we have lamellae, lamellae, lamellae. Notice that you've got all these caniculi, the fine fissures that communicate with cell to cell in the lacunae. So if you look at this, this is a, a picture of compact bone. This is an entire osteon. Here's where you would have the central canal. Here's where you would have all of your, you'd have a lamellae here. You'd have another lamellae here. You'd have another one. And you have the caniculi with the little fissures. Now what they did here was, it's kind of called ground bone for image. And what they did was removed all the tissue, etc. But you definitely still have all of the imprints of the structures of that osteon. You'll notice that you have a lot of the osteons here, but then you'll have some of the circumferential on the outside and some of the remaining circumferential on the inside of these uh, layers, the lamellae. Uh, you'll have a few in between the complete osteons here, here, here. That's interstitial lamellae. You have the endosteum on this side. You have the perosteum on this side. You have the central canals, and then you have the perforating canals here to here to here. And we see the medullary cavity where you have the osteogenic cells. Well, they will basically, those are the stem cells, they will eventually convert into either osteoclasts or osteoblasts. Now, spongy bone, what is that? It consists of a network of trabeculae. It's almost like these fine plates or spicules. The caniculi pits are open onto the surface of the trabeculae. The trabeculae are oriented along stress lines of bone and uh, basically are cross-braced. There are no osteons. The endosteum covers the trabeculae. 
and the nutrient transfers by diffusion. As I mentioned to you before, when you get into the medullary cavity, you're going to find red uh, marrow, which is active with blood cell synthesis. It's very present in long bones, such as the femur, the sternum, the ilium. You will also find on the edges of the red marrow, yellow marrow, marrow and that is inactive uh, bone marrow, but can be activated uh, with certain hormonal signals, etc. So we look at the spongy bone up through here, and what do we see? There's no set osteons. You do have lamellae. You do have osteocytes in these lamellae. You have an endosteum around this. You've got these little caniculae openings onto the surface. You have the trabeculae of the spongy bone. You can see all of these. Okay. Now, there's two types of bone growth we're going to talk about. One is appositional, and the other we're going to get into in a second. I don't want to give it away, but you do need to know both of these. So let's talk about appositional bone growth first. This involves growth from the outer bone covering where the parosteum is and the inner bone covering where the endosteum is. Osteogenic cells in the inner layer of the parosteum differentiate into osteoblasts. Remember, blasts build. Additional circumferential lamellae are deposited. The osteoblasts are trapped in these lamellae and differentiate into osteocytes. So that's how we get the osteocytes kind of in these lamellae sites. Now, as the bone is added outward, the osteoclasts are removing and recycling lamellae at the inner surface. The medullary cavity gradually will enlarge in diameter. So you can see here we started here. Here's the situation of an infant, child, young adult, and adult. So what are we watching? We are watching here as bone is deposited here, and we have the bone matrix that's being removed by the osteoclasts here. So obviously, as expansion is occurring here, expansion is occurring outward on the outer edge. The bone gets bigger, but so does the medullary cavity. Okay? So, as an end result, when we get to adulthood, we've got this larger medullary cavity and a lot of osteo uh, material in the form, <coughs> excuse me, in the form of compact bone. Now, additional for circum, uh, circumferential lamellae will be deposited, and the bone continues to increase in diameter. So as you can see here, we continue to be having this layer upon layer upon layer. What's helping to supply some of the cells? The perosteum. Now, that's appositional bone growth. You need to keep in mind the uh, players here. The perosteum is going to isolate bone from the surrounding tissues, provide a route for uh, blood and nerve supply, and actively play a role in bone growth and repair, does not make the original bone, though. We'll get into that in a few minutes. Perforating fibers. Now, when you look at the edge of the bone, it looks smooth if you just looked at a simple bone. So how do you make an anchoring or connection between a tendon and a bone, between a ligament and a bone, between a muscle and a bone. This is where you're going to have the formation of perforating fibers. Now, these are collagen fibers, usually from tendons, ligaments, joint capsules, etc. that are cemented into the circumferential lamellae to provide a strong attachment to the bone. So instead of just being on the surface where they could tear, they're really embedded into the actual bone matrix. That doesn't mean, though, that they can't still tear. It just means that it would be a greater amount of forces to cause that. When we talk about the endosteum for this type of growth, we have incomplete cellular layers that line the medullary cavity. They're located on the trabeculae and, lines, and line the central canal. They consist of a single flat layer of osteogenic cells that cover bone matrix. Osteoclasts occur in shallow depressions called osteoclastic crypts. Okay. So, if we were to take an image here and look at a bone and peel away some of the perosteum, we're going to have two layers. 
a cellular layer here and a fibrous layer out here. And the cellular layer is going to be smack dab right next to the circumferential layer. Okay? And you can see all the caniculi here and the osteocytes in their lacuna. And then you have these perforating fibers that are part of the cellular layer. They may come out from the fibrous layer, but basically they're going to anchor deep into these uh, lamellae. Now, if you go from the outside to the inside, here's the endosteum cell line. Here's an osteogenic cell. Here is this osteoid material, and here these are osteoblasts. But you see the osteocyte here. You see them circumferential layer, and what do you see? You've got this crypt here where the osteoclast is actively breaking down some of the bone material right here. Now, the other issue is how do we get what we call endochondral bone ossification? This is bone formation that begins in the embryo about six weeks after fertilization. Endochondral ossification consists of cartilages that are gradually replaced with bone. As the bone forms, bone growth increases in both length, that's the interstitial growth, and diameter. The pr uh, primary ossification center, um, you basically have fibroblasts migra migrating with the blood vessels that differentiate into osteoblasts and begin the production of sp spongy bone. Secondary ossification centers, uh, this is going to be due to the migration of osteoblasts and capillaries into the epiphyses. And the synthesis of the bone will start there. Remember that we're going to have, in long bones, epiphyses, and then you're going to have these uh, diaphyses. So you're going to have the epiphyses as sort of these knobby ends, and the diaphyses, which is going to be the long structure. Now, interstitial growth occurs at the metaphyses, this, this margin here between the epiphyses and the diaphyses. Epiphyseal cartilage. This is the formation of cartilage at the epiphyses and separates the epiphyses from the diaphyses. And then we have what I called earlier the epiphyseal plate. This is the site of epiphyseal cartilage. And we have these growth lines or epiphyseal uh, plates, growth plates as they call them in other names, um, they will close up. They will stop expanding with cartilage. Um, but what they'll do is they'll eventually calcify up. And this is going to be the completion of epiphyseal growth due to sex hormone signals. The site becomes calcified. Here's an example of this. This is called endochondral bone ossification. So in these structures, which start off pretty much as hyaline cartilage, you have the enlarging chondrocytes within the calcifying matrix here. You have more blood supply here, so you're now going to have uh, some activity in here, but also the beginning of this formation of bone on the outer edge. Now, this bone, and eventually the subsequent next step, which will be bone coming in here, uh, the bone here on the edge, this is called a bone collar. What you have is a lot of activity in the diaphysis, okay? And you have a blood vessel running in here, and as you start building up, having a primary ossification center here, you got a little bit of superficial bone here, you got a lot of spongy bone here, and note that you're still having these chondrocytes, they're enlarging, and they're beginning to add on to a calcified matrix. Now that's the length. What about these guys up here? Well, we're going to get into that in a second. Notice that this is still cartilage here, cartilage here. This is the metaphyses. And what you also notice is that both levels of bone here and here, you're going to have this expansion here as you develop a medullary cavity. You have to have a lot more um, basic blood supply to account for the metabolic activity for the construction here. Now, if we go to the next one, that's where we have secondary ossification centers beginning to form. 
you're going to start forming also along this collar here, compact bone. Still got spongy bone. Okay. You're going to notice that you have a blood vessel coming through here. You have hyaline cartilage on the outside, but on the inside, you're forming this spongy bone structure. And it's going to be all hyaline for a while. And eventually you have articular cartilage just at the bone to bone meeting site, the joint place. Spongy bone is here. This is bone here. And you have epiphyseal cartilage. You've got your metaphyses right here. What's going to happen is you're going to continue to keep growing. And in the later parts down here will eventually calcify. So this accounts for the spongy bone on the edges here of the epiphyseal line or the epiphyseal plate. You've got spongy bone here, spongy bone here. Eventually you stop growth because this area, which is, was this, the epiphyseal cartilage calcifies. You have the medullary cavity down here. You stop having lengthwise growth. This image helps the, con the chondrocytes of the epiphyseal side of the cartilage continue to divide and enlarge. They divide and enlarge, divide and enlarge, etc. The ones on the lower end, okay, these guys are still dividing up here. These guys down here, the chondrocytes here, degenerate at the diaphyseal side. The osteoblasts migrate upward from the diaphyses, and the cartilage is grad gradually replaced by bone. Okay? Now, you see, here's an x-ray right here. This is to have an appreciation for this. Obviously, you can see the humerus, but you see this much more enhanced calcification right here. That's the epiphyseal line, or they call it the epiphyseal plate. This tells you that the growth has stopped. Okay? Now, the other type of bone ossification and really bone growth is intramembranous bone ossification. It begins when the mesenchymal cells, this is embryonic or fibrous connective tissue, differentiate into osteoblasts. This occurs in deep dermis, called the dermal or membrane bones. What would those be? This forms in usually flat bones of the skull, the parietal, frontal, and occipital. It will occur in the mandible, the collarbone, meaning the clavicle, and the patella, the kneecap. Mesenchymal cells differentiate into osteoblasts, and they do they undergo the start synthesis of the osteoid. The developing bone grows into spicules. But then, after it's developed into spicules, it's the trapped osteoblasts become osteocytes. The osteoblasts trigger blood vessel growth. Some vessels get trapped in the developing bone. Ah, does that begin to sound like something you've heard before? Okay. This is continued deposition of bone forms, and you get more plates of spongy bone, but the subsequent remodeling of the bone progresses from spongy to compact as you start seeing the development of osteons that form around the blood vessels. The perosteum layers form, which you want, that's cellular and fibrous. Fibrous is the outermost cellular, is right in contact with the bone tissue. The spongy tissue is remodeled to form diploe, which is sandwiched, compact with a spongy interior. Okay, now look. This is only going to occur in a few situations here, like the mandible or the flat bones of the parietal, occipital, and frontal bone. Let me stay with this for a second. You've got osteoid here. You've got mesenchyme cells. You've got the bone matrix starting to form, because what? Around this is all osteoblasts. They have converted from mesenchymal cells, and they're going to start building these little islands a bone matrix, which will eventually start fusing together, forming spicules. Now, the ones that get trapped inside are going to eventually mature into osteocytes. And also what's going to happen is you notice that there were blood vessels here, here, 
here, here, here. They're going to start getting trapped. And a blood vessel that's trapped within the bone matrix is going to be, in essence, the center where you're going to start seeing the formation, uh, in some cases, of osteons. The osteocytes are going to be in the, the lacunae. They're going to get organized. You've got the blood vessels here. Now, it's good that you want to have the blood vessels because that's going to accelerate nutrient delivery for metabolically more active cells, such as osteoblasts, and laying down more bone tissue, etc. The, bone, uh, the blood vessels are trapped within the bone matrix. You have a fibrous perosteum, a cellular perosteum, and now you've got spongy bone, but then eventually you're going to start forming some arrangements here with compact bone. You'll have compact bone here, compact bone here, and in between, spongy bone, the diploid. Now, you can see some of this uh, if you take a look here. At 10 weeks of development, you'll see that there are intramembranous ossification centers that produce the roofing bones of the skull here and here. Notice that it's red because of increased blood delivery. Primary ossification centers are the long bones of the lower limb. Notice here, and here, and here, and the future hip bones. Now, that's 10 weeks. Go to 16 weeks, and now what you see are the formations of flat bones of the skull here and here and here. You also see the development of long bones in the limbs. Okay? All right. Now... We're going to start looking at pathologies for bone growth, and one of them right off the bat is the pituitary growth hormone failure. Growth hormone deficiency, GHD, also known as dwarfism or pituitary dwarfism, is a condition caused by insufficient amounts of growth hormone in the body. Children with GHD have abnormally short stature with normal body proportions. Now, this can be treated with exogenous growth hormone shots. I'll give you an example of something that happened. Um, doctors today will not um, have parents come in and go, look, the kid's going to be short. We don't want him. We want him to be a basketball player. Doctor's kind of looking at the parents going, are you nuts? But if the parents come in and say, we're kind of concerned he is somewhat short, and um, we were wondering if there was some way we could supply him with some exogenous growth hormone. That's when the doctor does the, the counseling talks with the child, goes through all of the other necessary uh, checks to make sure that the child is, in fact, producing insufficient growth hormone. And there may be a program uh, of certain shots over a period of time to enhance growth. Now, the first case I gave you sounds crazy, but there have actually been situations reported in bioethical papers. That's why they usually have the entire family get interviewed over the entire issue before the child undergoes getting growth hormone shots. Now, achondroplasia. This is a hereditary condition in which the growth of the long bones by ossification of cartilage is, is retarded, resulting in very short limbs and sometimes a face that is small in relationship to the normal size skull. Here you have growth hormone deficiency. Here you have achondroplasia, okay? So you have the shortened limbs, the body, smaller facial compared to the rest of the skull, okay? Moving on, there are several other bone growth pathologies that would be helpful to know of. Marfan syndrome is one of them. Marfan syndrome is a genetic disorder that affects the body's connective tissue. Now remember, that connective tissue, uh, or actually collagen fibers, are extremely important in bone growth. But in this case, what we're going to be talking about is the connective tissue holds all the body cells together, organs and tissue together. Usually what happens is you have extensive overproduction of fibrillin 1 in some way or another. Its symptoms are manifest by very tall, very long, slender limbs due to excessive cartilage formation at the epithelial cartilages. The problem with this is that there is a high risk of cardiovascular disorder. Individuals can be tall, 
but they also put a risk on the heart and also the very same gene that works on the connective tissue also has a reinforcing effect in the aorta. And so sometimes what happens is that Marfan syndrome patients have a higher risk of aortic, um, aortic rupture than anything else. Here's an example of, oh, we'll get into that in a second. Now, congenital tapis equinovarnus, otherwise known as club foot. This is a congenital condition. Boys are affected more than girls. Tapis means the ankle or foot. Equinovarnus refers to the position that the foot is in. This is a birth defect where one or both feet are rotated inward and downward. The affected foot and leg may be smaller than the other. In about half of those affected, both feet are involved. The prompt treatment with casts and other supports at infancy help to alleviate the problem, although sometimes surgery is involved. Here is the congenital tapis uh, equinovarus. As you can see, both feet are inward, somewhat downward, and so they have to be put into a cast and to a structure that will help realign the growth. Here's an individual with Marfan syndrome, as you can see, very, very long, long arms, very, very long legs, usually much thinner, okay? And so you have situations where they would uh, also be at risk for aortic aneurysms, a ballooning out of the aorta and a breaking of it, and that's why they're monitored because fibrillin is an important gene uh, a pro protein that allows for resiliency and constraints of forces within blood vessels, etc., but also uh, in controlling cartilage growth. The next two are relatively well known gigantism or giantism. This is a condition characterized by excessive growth and height significantly above average. In humans, this condition is caused by overproduction of growth hormone in childhood, resulting in people from 7 to 9 feet, so that's 2.1 to 2.7 meters in height. Uh, many times this is due to a pituitary gland tumor. And I think I've mentioned this before, but one of the key factors when you get into the endocrine system and you talk about cancer is that when a cell that is normally endocrine producing a particular hormone goes cancerous, it usually goes completely wild with the production or overproduction of that particular hormone that it would normally be producing. Now, acromegaly is a little bit different. If the growth hormone levels rise after the epiphyseal plates close, you have excessive hormone that's going to lead to excessive growth in cartilage and a thickening of the facial bones. Uh, examples would be a tower skull, larger hands and jaws. Now, I might also note, acromegaly can still occur after, if one is also still uh, having gigantism. In other words, the gigantism, the increased height occurs, the overproduction of growth hormone continues well after the epiphyseal plates have closed, and now what you have is this overproduction of hormone that's going to cause excessive growth of those bones that would respond. Skull bones, hand bones, jaw bones. Here's an example of uh, giantism. This gentleman is very, very tall, as you can see. I think he was one of the ones that's, um, I believe, almost like eight or nine feet tall. Now, anyone with giantism because you're having a much larger cardiovascular uh, system, they are more subject to cardiovascular problems. In other words, heart attacks, high blood pressure, um, and it's rare to have someone with giantism uh, make it to the age of 70, or even in many cases, 60, okay? Now, acromegaly, as you can see here, here's the lower jaw being overextended. Tower skull would be something where you see the side bones here continue to grow, etc. But this is something that's not 
unusual because this bone would still be able to grow and so it continues outward. Fibrodysplasia ossificans progressiva, FOP. It's a rare inherited disorder in which skeletal muscle and connective tissue, such as the tendons and ligaments, are gradually replaced by bone. Uh, they're ossified. This condition leads to bone formation outside the skeleton. In other words, extraskeletal or heterotopic bone growth that restricts movement. It is also called the stone man syndrome. Here you see an individual and from the exterior you can see that they're kind of with a curved spine, etc. Here is the effects of FOP. What you're having is uh, connective tissue and other types of tissue converting over into bone and so the individual is having excessive bone material placed in a lot of different areas leading to curvature of the spine, curvature in the neck, and reduced mobility in the arms, etc. Okay? Now, we also have to consider osteoporosis. As you see here, this is a normal bone. Uh, you can see the spongy bone here. You will see some of the formations here. Cells are doing quite nicely. Here is osteoporotic bone. And in this case, you notice a lot more small holes, almost like little craters and divots. And the overall structure is not good. As a matter of fact, it's a lot more fragile and cannot handle some of the weight or some of the other forces of stress on this bone. They would break. Where do you see this happening? Uh, for a lot of women, it occurs after uh, when they hit postmenopausal because they have decreased production of estrogen. Now, there's something to be aware of also. There was a point where some women uh, started to do hormone replacement therapy. And there were some studies that were a little bit positive in their indication that osteoporosis could be reduced by use of hormone replacement therapy. Basically, this would be either by taking a type of pill or by having a patch. And the drug being put into them would be estrogen. Uh, for some women, it was a godsend. The problem was that by the end of the 1990s, almost 2000, the FDA determined that hormone replacement therapy had to be eliminated uh, because in part, hormones tend to cause cancers to grow quite quickly. And so any of the women that were subject to the possibility of an ovarian, a uterine, a breast cancer, uh, any of these type of reproductive cancers, being on hormone replacement therapy, they could have a rapid uh, onset growth and termination of their life because of the presence of this added hormone. Nowadays, they use other drugs, uh, bisphosphates and other types, that attempt to elevate the phosphate level, which would allow for the sequestering of the calcium phosphate into the bones and keeping it in that direction as opposed to losing a bone calcium. Now, here is an unusual one. This actually, I found that uh, there was a history of medicine article that was in Scientific American. And let me explain to you the entire background here. Paget's disease. Paget's disease is a um, bone growth disorder. And what happens, as you can see here, uh, by looking at on the left, the facial bone that is grossly thickened, symmetrically deformed, and Paget's disease causes this overabundance of growth, etc., to the point where the skeletal bones, particularly the skull, build up tremendous amounts of compact bone. Now, one of the things you're going to find as an indicator is the whitening of the Pagetic bone. And if you notice right over here, this is caused by an impact. And it's apparent in this centuries-old fossilized parietal bone unearthed 
in the mid-1700s. Now, the individual that did the history of medicine analysis talked about a hero of the Icelandic sagas, a warrior by the name of Egil. And this may have been what the individual suffered from. Because what you see in this skull, they may have suffered from the disease several centuries prior to that. Um, Edgel was considered to be a great warrior, etc. And literally, those that attempted to kill him in battle, his skull was so thickened that it could deflect the blow of a, a direct blow of an axe or the hammer side of an axe. As you can see, there's no, there's no piercing of the skull. But there are some really serious health problems that eventually uh, occur. You notice there are no teeth. What gets filled in completely in both the mandibular and the axial area are uh, basically the gumphosis, so they lose teeth. Also, you'll notice that the nasal cavity becomes exceedingly narrow. The fusion of the zygomatic bridges occurs, and eventually the eyes lose vision as you can see, the orbits become filled with bone. Now, this is nothing because if you were to saw through this, you would find layers upon layers of solid bone, which would eventually take the life of the individual by literally putting tremendous pressure and leading to seizures and other malfunctions because the brain was being literally encased in bone and crushed. Let's talk about bone as a mineral reservoir for a few minutes. The bone holds 99% of the body's calcium and phosphate, 80% of the body's carbonate, and 50% of the body's magnesium. In bones, osteoblasts continuously deposit new bone matrix. Osteoclasts degrade bone matrix to free up calcium and phosphate for the blood. Both are controlled by hormonal signals. In the intestines, they uh, absorb calcium and phosphate from our diet. The kidneys will excrete calcium and phosphate via hormonal regulation. So we got the basics down there. So we can see that we have to have a certain normal level of ionic calcium present in our blood at any time. So the reservoir of calcium in a lot of cases is the bone. If we have too much, we can get rid of excess uh, via the kidneys, calcium phosphate ions. We could also decrease the amount of absorption of calcium and phosphate in the intestine. But if we need to rapidly shift and increase our uh, supply of calcium ions in the blood, usually this is going to be by certain signals that will initiate the release, uh, mobilization as it's called, of calcium and phosphate ions into the circulation. So this gets us into that famous uh, term that we dealt with in chapter one, homeostasis. Calcium ion homeostasis is regulated by the hormones, parathyroid hormone, calcitriol, and calcitonin. Parathyroid hormone, PTH, is made in the parathyroid glands and acts to lower blood calcium, acts on low blood calcium levels, excuse me. So that causes the elevation of blood calcium levels. Calcitriol is made in the kidneys and increases the rate of calcium absorption in the intestine. Calcitonin is made by C cells of the thyroid. It acts on high blood calcium levels. Okay. The skeleton plays a key role in calcium ion homeostasis. When, when a large number of calcium ions are released into the blood, the bones become weaker. When calcium salts are deposited, the bones become stronger. Kind of makes sense. So here's how we modulate uh, calcium, blood calcium levels. Now, we're going to start off with low calcium ion levels in the blood first. So if, if we're going below 8.5 milligrams per deciliter, do that with a, a basic blood test. Parathyroid's response is as follows. You're going to have secretion of PTH. So osteoclasts don't have PTH receptor. This is the thing you want to keep in mind. 
PTH does bind to adjacent osteoblasts, which is, causes them to release a hormone called rankle, which is receptor activator of nuclear factor kappa B ligand. It's a mouthful. But what it basically does is it stimulates immature osteoclasts to differentiate into mature osteoclasts. So it's a two-step process instead of just a simple one-way path. Once you have mature osteoclasts, they're going to erode the bone matrix and thereby releasing more calcium ions that have been sequestered in the bone matrix. Calcium ions will, of course, be released and elevate calcium levels, calcium ion levels in the blood. Also, PTH will enhance the calcium-absorbing effects of calcitriol on the intestine. As a result, the rate of intestinal calcium absorption increases. More calcium absorption, more calcium in the blood. Kidney response. PTH is going to increase the renal production of the hormone calcitriol. And under normal circumstances, a low level of calcitriol is always there because it is secreted continuously by the kidneys. So this just revs up the engines. What calcitriol stimulates is calcium reabsorption by the kidneys and calcium absorption in the intestines. So kidneys are going to affect not only the kidney, but the intestine. And what is going to happen is you have less calcium lost in the urine and you will have also more calcium in the blood. Now, how is it that we have a limit? Well, you can't keep absorbing calcium, calcium, calcium in the blood. You've got a limit. Now, the high end of calcium ion levels would be anything above 11 milligrams per deciliter. So, remember, homeostasis is going to control changes not only on the low end, but on the high end. Okay? So that's where we get into the C cells in the thyroid gland that are going to secrete calcitonin. When calcitonin is released, it's going to decrease osteoclast activity, but does not affect osteoblasts. So what's going to happen is you're going to have this depositing of calcium ions within the bone matrix. As you increase the productivity, or I should say increase the sequestering of calcium ions in the bone matrix, calcium levels will begin to drop in the blood. Next, calcitonin, the intestinal response. Decreasing PTH or calcitriol levels results in a decrease in the rate of calcium ion absorption by the intestines. So calcium is going to be absorbed slower and you'll have less going into the blood. Now, finally, the kidneys. This is interesting because when you have increased calcitonin levels, it has an inhibitory effect on the kidneys and suppresses calcium ion reabsorption. So now you're going to increase your calcium excretion. More calcium is lost in the urine. Okay, so now that you've got the homeostasis, go over that and practice it because you will be needing to know that, not only in this course, but subsequently in AP2 and in your clinical courses. Let's talk about bone fractures for a few minutes. Damage to a bone constitutes a fracture. Now, everybody talks about a fracture. They see the bone cast. They see this. They see that. What's really going on? Now, a lot of times you're going to have fractures that heal after damage, whether it's severe or light. And this is provided by the blood supply and the cellular components of the endosteum and periosteum survive. That's one of the key points. But then you got to deal with fracture hematoma. What's going on? You have a large blood clot that closes off injured vessels and leaves a fibrosis, a fibrous mes meshwork in the damaged area. Now we're going to deal with all the following steps. So you need to be aware of this. So you have already this blood clot. Now you're going to form this callus. This is a migration of cells from the endosteum and periosteum into the damaged area. You will have an internal callus. This forms a, a network of kind of spongy bone that unites the inner edges of the fracture. Now, the external callus 
The cartilage and bone are going to encircle and stabilize the outer edges of the fracture. Now, later on, the bone fragments, the dead tissue remove, uh, are removed, while the osteoblasts re replace the central cartilage of the external callus with spongy bone, which unites the broken ends. Now, bone swelling at the damaged site will later be remodeled. So let's talk about this for a few minutes. Now, now keep in mind something. When I'm talking about this fracture, don't think of it as really just a crack. Maybe there's a major breakage. We'll go over the different types of fractures in a few minutes. But once you have a break, what do you know? Well, if I break uh, in the compact bone, that means I'm going to also rupture blood vessels. That means you're going to have some bleeding in here. That means that also some of the bone is going to be starved for blood after you start forming the clot. So you have a fracture hematoma. This is the clot. But what also happens? You've got some of that clot that's elevating some of the parts of the parostium. Also, right around here and right around here, there's no more blood circulating, so these cells are going to die. Okay, so step one, callus formation. Spongy bone in the internal callus. The cartilage of the external callus here. The spongy bone of the external callus here. And, of course, you've got this parostium. Now, if the parostium had been ripped, that takes even more uh, care to put the tissue close enough together so that you can have a reestablishment. And what do I mean by that? Let's say somebody has a deep puncture that the bone uh, actually goes out of the arm or it goes where basically the parostium is ruptured because of the sharp edges of the bone, etc., so that's going to have require more support and manipulation by a surgeon. Okay, so we've got the callus formation, spongy bone formation. What's happening here? You have an internal callus here. Now this is not what you'd put a ton of weight on it. Okay, you've got the beginning of blood vessels forming. You've got the beginning of bone structure here. You're going to have an internal callus and an external callus. And then you're going to finally have compact bone formation. This is where you have the external callus here. What you have to keep in mind is that it's going to be a while before this bone is totally healed up. And the interesting thing is that at the site of the break, it may be actually more tougher, more stronger than what it previously was. Now let's get into bone fracture types. Yes, you need to know all these because you're going to get tested on them. You can be best uh, understand that. When we talk about an open fracture, it's also referred to as compound fracture, the bone pierces the skin and usually the patient passes out. No, not necessarily so, but they're really not happy campers. The closed fracture is simple. You have a break that's completely internal. Transverse, you have a break in the bone shaft, a across the long axis. If it's spiral, it's produced by the twisting stresses spread along the length of the bone. The problem there is that if it's a spiral, it probably has one or several areas that are now created sharp edges uh, along the lines of the bone break. Those have to be uh, taken care of specially because as the patient is moved, you could have those sharp edges leading to either piercing of the skin or breaking other major blood vessels or nerves. Displaced, the fractured bone bones produce new and are an abnormal alignment. Non-displaced, the fractured bones retain their normal alignment. When you have a compression fracture, this is the vertebrae is subjected to extreme stress. You can also see this during osteoporosis, so literally part of the vertebrae is crushed, almost appears. Green stick is kind of twisted, but there's a, like a thin line. It's very common with kids because kids tend to have uh, a little bit more of the proteinaceous components, yeah, car, uh, 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 collagen, as opposed to just purely mineralized bone. And so they're going to have a little bit more flexibility, but you can still see that minor break. They just have to be careful for a while, and it will heal up. 
Comununid is shattered bone fragments. Um, in that case, you have to bring the individual in for surgery. They have to remove some of the bone fragments. They may try to tie some of them together with certain structures, but at times it's going to be really difficult. An epiphyseal fracture is the fracture at the epiphyseal plate. So if you can imagine the epiphyseal plate, you have the epiphyseal uh, part and the diaphysis and right where the epiphyseal plate is, it's a separation. That's a concern uh, for all parents when they have growing kids because they have to go in and really sort of pin these together properly so that you will have continued normal growth of that long bone. Pod's fracture is a bimalleolar fracture. Okay. You see it in the ankle site. It affects both the distal parts of the tibia and the fibular malleolus. Colley's fracture, this is a break of the distal part of the radius, as if someone's trying to cushion a fall, so they uh, basically stick their arms out and it doesn't work out well. Here's the colleague of fracture right there. So they had stake with their hands down and crunch. Here's the POTS fracture here. Here is the epiphyseal fracture, and you can see how it's out of alignment. So what would require is the possibility of either a surgeon coming in and pinning these two bones together in a proper alignment. As you can see here with the comminuted fractures, you can see the fragments here. You would have to do surgery pin as much of this together, maybe with assistance of wires, et cetera, and you may have to remove some of the sharper pieces, otherwise they would continue to grow bone, which can be a problem. You look at a transverse fracture. Here's the long axis. Here's the area where the break occurs, so it's perpendicular. Here is a spiral fracture. Notice the points here and down here because it was twisted. As a result, if this bone shifts, it could cut tissue above here or down here, and that's what you don't want. A displaced fracture, as you can see here, these are where the bones are totally out of alignment, and you would definitely need a surgeon to do some internal work to align certain bones and to remove certain small fragments. Here is a vertebrae. This is the normal vertebrae. This is the next normal vertebrae. This one is crushed. So that's what they call a compression fracture. A green stick fracture, you can see that fine little line right there. Usually a twisting force that occurred to cause that fracture. Uh, by the way, let me just bring up a couple of other ones, but I want to give you a little story in the midst of it. Uh, years ago, I used to work in a surgery. I was talking with a set of doctors and I'm talking with one of them. Uh, this set of doctors had come in and were working for 10 hours on a patient. Now, let me explain to you how the patient was injured. You can go back here for a second. The individual was on a cherry picker, which is one of these platforms you go up quite a height, and the hydraulics failed, which meant basically he was dumped from a great height. And when he came down, he landed on his feet. That meant that ankles downward, all sorts of bones were destroyed, crushed, damaged. So I said to the doctor after the 10 hours, I said, how'd it go? And the doctor replied, well, he said in the old days, we would have removed both feet and given him prosthetics, and that would have been fine. But the patient didn't want that. And so what can I do? You know, he basically, they spent 10 hours pinning, putting screws in, wiring together all the bones. He said, but the problem is now for the rest of this guy's life, he will be in pain for every step he takes. And the doctor raised hand and just kind of walked away. It's like, you know, I couldn't do anything else. And so you have to understand the mechanisms that occur here and some of the complications. Okay, here's a depressed not that he is emotionally depressed. You can see this crater right here. Type of skull fracture that occurs where the broken bone is pressed inward. And this is a critical point because this can also lead to uh, 
bleeding against the brain, tears of the meninges, or even actually tears into the brain tissue itself. Here's another example of that green stick I told you about. And that's it. Great job. Now, you are to peruse the chapter review on pages 235 to 236. You are to complete review questions, pages 237 to 238. Complete the review sheets on 228 and 224 for review. The next chapter we're going to deal with is the skeleton. And we're going to start moving into all the different bones and all the different bone markings and the entire arrangement. So, we'll see you soon. Have a nice day. <laughs>